Northern Ireland. The six of Ireland's 32 counties, which still remain part of the United Kingdom. Here, for over a decade, there has been civil war. In its capital, Belfast, troops patrol the streets to assist the police in areas where they cannot safely go. The conflict is between those Catholics who wish to become part of a united Ireland and those Protestants who insist that they remain part of the United Kingdom. This sectarian divide is not new. These wasted streets have seen riot and commotion in nearly every decade of the 19th and 20th centuries. This is merely the present phase of what the Irish call the Troubles, a state of affairs rooted in earlier Troubles at the beginning of the century that resulted in the partition of Ireland. In 1921, the whole of Ireland was a part of the United Kingdom, and most of it was in open rebellion against British rule. Then the army was needed to keep order on the Dublin streets. An illegal Irish parliament was in hiding. In some areas, control of local government and the courts had been wrested from the British, and the Irish Republican Army was waging effective guerrilla war against the security forces. British authority in Ireland was under duress. In British internment camps, some 4,000 IRA men were being held without trial. These men and their colleagues were attempting to lever the British out of Ireland by making it ungovernable. To this end, they had attacked police stations, courthouses, post offices, and intimidated British officials. They had shot dead over 300 Irish policemen, many of whom were British, and known as the Black and Tans. As they attempted to keep control in Ireland, the Black and Tans had taken reprisals against those thought to support the IRA. Villages were burnt, creameries wrecked, homes destroyed. In November 1920, for example, they took revenge after 16 of their number had died in an ambush near Cork. As a small child in my nursery, I woke up to see the flames reflected through the north window on the wall, and I thought it was an Aurora Bora Alice, which we had seen the week before, and I called my father. It was between, I suppose, 8 and 9 o'clock at night. And he said, no, he said, it is the damn British burning Cork. I was a fireman, fire brigade, and uh, I received a call to proceed to Edgelands Cross. And on our way out, I saw the, we saw the fire in the Grand Parade, part of Patrick's Day burning like, so we couldn't proceed any further. Led through an incendiary into the city hall as a last gasp, and that went up with a terrific crash. We saw that going up because that was lit by gas. And when we turned on the water, all the horses were all stabbed with paints and rendered them all useless. Black and Tans had gone into Cork, first looting and then burning down part of the city centre. They had prevented firemen from dealing with the blaze. And the black smoke was coming up for nearly a week up the hill. And, you know, we were nearly suffocated. It was, it was immense. It was as bad as anything I have seen in the blitz in London. There was hardly a building left. British liberal opinion was outraged by these reprisals. Asquith reflected, things are being done in Ireland which would disgrace the blackest annals of the lowest despotisms in Europe. I used to carry the holster on the thigh with a revolver, but hanging from the ring of the revolver, they had a half a burnt cork. 
And the attitude was that if you ambush us, and you know what's going to happen, half of Cork's been burnt, and be careful, we might burn your place down. Over the next few months, hundreds of homes of those suspected of being involved with the IRA were destroyed by Crown forces, although it is unclear how many were officially sanctioned. In May 1921, the IRA burnt down the local government office in Dublin, and Britain's shaky control over the country was further weakened. Militarily, the British had few options. Even if they broke the IRA, which was now a serious possibility, it would mean little. As a result of the conduct of the Black and Tans, the vast majority of the Irish were now too hostile to British rule to accept any compromise solution. As Lloyd George inspected the Black and Tans in London, his military advisers were telling him that Ireland could now only be subdued by draconian measures, including martial law. So now the British would have to try and conjure up a political solution. It had already been proposed that there should be home rule, limited independence for Ireland. Protestants in the north had objected to being included in a Catholic Ireland, so two home rule parliaments were proposed. One in Belfast for the six counties of the northeast, and one in Dublin for the other 26. In the north, the proposal had been received without enthusiasm, but it did give Protestants, shown in orange, a majority over Catholics, shown in green, of two to one. It would keep the Protestants out of a Catholic Ireland, give them control of the Belfast Parliament, and keep them within the United Kingdom. So they agreed. And in May 1921, they elected the Parliament, which would administer the province's domestic affairs. It had a substantial Protestant Unionist majority. When George V, the British King, arrived in June to open the Parliament, Protestants, who had threatened civil war rather than become part of a united Ireland, thronged the quayside to welcome him and affirm their loyalty to the British Crown. Very rapidly, the feeling of not wanting the devolved parliament gave way to a sense of pride in the Belfast parliament and the sense that with some good fortune, it might be able to operate as a separate legislature under, of course, the overall supremacy of the imperial parliament at Westminster. <laughs> But not everybody welcomed the king. A third of the population was Catholic and wanted a united Ireland. The visit itself, in, in a way, set a seal on the constitutional propriety of the setting up of Parliament. From the Unionist point of view, this was a very much needed boost to morale and made the best possible beginning for the new Parliament. His speech was conciliatory and obviously directed towards the South. I appeal to all Irishmen to stretch out the hand of forbearance, to forgive and forget, and to join in making for the land which they love a new era of peace. It was time for a truce. Political events were moving. There was an embryonic state or apparatus of state beginning in the north and it was time to begin serious initiatives as well so that things would not get out of hand. The IRA was showing clear signs of wear and it's quite possible that had the British pressed on through the summer of 1921 uh, they might have destroyed large parts of the IRA organization but this would have required a sort of effort which Lloyd George had by now decided was politically impossible. The political climate did seem to be favorable. That is to say, public opinion, both in, in Britain and in America, seemed to be favorable towards the Irish claims in view of the stories of reprisals of the Black and Tans and of the conduct of the War of Independence. Propaganda, in propaganda terms, it was a favorable climate of opinion in which to begin negotiations. But it was one thing to go to the negotiating table, another to reach a settlement. 
The Irish delegation under, during the early stages, the leadership of de Valera sailed for London. For de Valera, veteran of the 1916 Rising, nothing less than an independent republic of all Ireland would suffice. But in Downing Street, he would be confronted by Lloyd George, who could offer, in the context of British politics, no more than a divided Ireland with limited independence within the empire. The prayers offered in Downing Street were not enough, and the negotiations dragged on for five months without the prospect of a settlement. By December, an impasse loomed. Abruptly and dramatically, on the 5th of December, Lloyd George presented them with a stark choice, effectively, take the terms now or be responsible for the collapse of the negotiations. He pulled out of his pocket two envelopes, both addressed to Sir James Craig in Belfast, and announced to the Irish delegation that he had that night to send one of these envelopes to Sir James Craig. One of them said that articles of agreement had been signed. The other said that Sinn Féin had refused to come into the empire. If I send this letter, he said, it is war, and war within three days. And he said, there's a train standing at Euston Station with steam up. There's a destroyer waiting at Hollyhead. Mr. Shakespeare is ready. This letter must go. It must go by 10 o'clock. I must have your reply by then. A theatrical gesture, but the pressure put on the Irish representatives was enough. They signed. The signatories had accepted independence within the empire and the partition of Ireland. When the Irish delegates posed for Pathé Cameraman the following day, their smiles were deceptive. Michael Collins had already reflected the previous night. Think, what have I got for Ireland? Something which she has wanted these past 700 years. Will anyone be satisfied at the bargain? Will anyone? The treaty was a great disappointment because we had been working up, as we thought, to an Irish Republic, and the treaty didn't give it to us. Worse than that, the partition, which cut off six counties, was, I think, the deciding factor for the Republican side. Suddenly everybody realized that the six counties, the little bit in the north of Ireland was handed over, still held by the British. Lloyd George had emerged with all he wanted. Northern Ireland was still in the United Kingdom, and the Irish still in the British Empire. The price of the settlement was to be paid in Ireland. The treaty split the nationalist movement. The, it split Dáil Éireann, uh, not exactly in halves, but, but certainly split it fairly disastrously, and led, of course, at a military and political level, and led to civil war. Such were the passions unleashed by the treaty that now, in the streets of Dublin, the Irish fought the Irish. Many Irish nationalists felt that under the threat of further war, an independent 26-county Ireland within the Empire was as much as could be reasonably extracted from the British. But for others, it was a betrayal. But a century of Republican struggle should have ended with a divided Ireland giving loyalty to an English king. By absorbing the energies of the nationalist movement in the 26 counties in bitter and bloody civil war, it also cut off the nationalists in the six counties of Northern Ireland from uh, those in the south with from the community whose hopes and whose aspirations and whose values and political ideas it largely shared. In the mayhem of the Civil War, the Catholics in Northern Ireland were almost forgotten. Up north, as Protestants celebrated their victory, the Catholics in the province felt betrayed and anxious fearful of their place in a Protestant state. The Unionist establishment was pictured at Lord Londonderry's garden party. 
But now they face the problem of governing a country where a substantial minority rejected the settlement and legitimacy of the Northern Ireland state. Somehow the Ulster Unionists had floated free on the raft of partition. They had got their own six counties, they got their own parliament and their own government. But the problems which were to plague the Northern Ireland government from 1920 onwards, uh, the problem of dealing with a dissident minority which could amount to almost a third, which amounted to almost a third of the total population. Uh, the democratic basis of any such state is consensus. And clearly, consent was not forthcoming from that minority. In the border areas around Belik, the Catholics were in rebellion and the IRA was fighting an effective guerrilla war. Raids, shootings and kidnappings were almost daily occurrences. In these same areas, nationalist Catholic councils had been elected and had promptly refused to accept the legitimacy of the Belfast government. In the areas with a Catholic majority, shown here in green, there were nationalist councils. Nearly a third of the province's local government was giving allegiance to the southern parliament. So civil disobedience and guerrilla war threatened to make the state ungovernable. The reaction of the Protestants to the, the rebel councils in 1921-22 was one of fear, I believe. That if the rebel councils that existed in, at that time, who were openly defying central government, who openly stated that their allegiance was to the parliament of the south and not to the new parliament of the north, then the, the central government and Protestants themselves felt that these people would have to be controlled. That if they got away with what they were attempting to, or doing or attempting to do, that they would destroy the state itself. When the new state was set up, it was set up against the wishes of the majority of the Irish people, including those who controlled these councils, the nationalists who controlled these councils. Uh, they saw no reason to accept the new state. The justification given for setting up the new state was that this was uh, the wish of the people in, in the northeast of Ireland. But if that was to be the case, if you were to take uh, self-determination in, in limited areas, well then the people in Tyrone and Fermanagh and in Derry City said they, by a majority, wish to be included in an all-Ireland state. So why should they be brought under this new state? So with nationalist councils like Londonderry declaring allegiance to the south, the situation in the province grew tense. Earlier rioting in Derry left 18 people dead. 1,500 troops were needed to keep peace in a town of 40,000. One soldier for every 27 people. With the Protestants besieged and Catholics aggrieved, there was sectarian violence throughout the province. The worst in Belfast, where a protracted campaign of terror was unleashed on the Catholic community, remembered to this day. Be lying in bed as a kid at night, you'd hear uh, a lorry suddenly coming along the street, and next thing you hear pounding on the door and uh, footsteps inside, and hoarse voices, and people had been trailed out, probably arrested. You didn't know whether they'd been arrested or whether they'd been taken away to be shot by uh, a body that was known as the murder gang at that time. If someone uh, had been taken by the police or if someone was murdered, well, there would be what we say in Irish, uh, the keening, the women crying. You may have heard the expression. And then we, if we heard the keening, then we knew that someone had been murdered by the forces. And I trailed them out of bed. And I shared it down for their mother to come up the stairs. And she went up. And they shot them five sons out of cold blood right along, one by one, in the following hour. Shot them dead and wanted her to witness. And in fact, in the morning paper, your parents would read out some item that somebody had been found in the fields with their hands tied with rosary beads or uh, a little sign hung around their heads, a spy or something like that. In fact, my own teacher at St. Paul's School, I remember one weekend uh, on my way to Mass, uh, hearing that he, in fact, had been murdered uh, that weekend. He used to come down our street every morning, seven o'clock, whistling with the ladders. So everybody missed Malachi this morning, there was no post. And the next thing we got the paper. 
Malachi half high. My God, such a death to give that boy. May God forgive the harm that done it. They cut the prey that's out of him. They tied him to the tree. And then they shot him after, after he'd done his sufferings. Between July 1920 and July 1922, 453 people were killed in Belfast, nearly two-thirds of them Catholic. Hundreds of Catholic families fled their homes. Over 10,000 Catholics lost their jobs, and 500 Catholic businesses were wrecked. It was a pogrom. Clashes had occurred on the same streets, along the same divide between Catholic and Protestant as in the 19th century, and would again later in the 20th century. Undoubtedly, there were attacks from the Catholic side directed towards the Protestant. Uh, but I think that the main reason for the Protestant attacks in the Catholic ghettos was simply because of the fact that most Catholics were seen to be people who gave their allegiance to the Parliament of Southern Ireland, and who did not give their allegiance to the new state of Northern Ireland. As well as that, we still had the IRA in existence. Indeed, uh, the IRA at that time were still in control of many of the, the border areas. And therefore, the Protestants felt and believed that the best way to deal with the situation was to go into the ghetto areas and root them out. It was a pogrom uh, which was endorsed by the leaders of the Unionist Party who were to become the government of the new state, uh, which was winked at by the police force, if, if not participated in by sections of what was to be the new police force, the special constabulary. They were known to be involved in reprisal killings and so on. And they then, in turn, uh, both became the reserve force of the government in successive years, but they also formed most of the, the backbone of the full-time police force. From the beginning, the police force in Northern Ireland was armed and predominantly Protestant. To back them up, a special constabulary was formed, the B Specials, as these part-time police were known. They were also armed and entirely Protestant. By 1922, nearly one in five of the adult male Protestant population was in the B Specials. They were bolstered by the Special Powers Act, which empowered the Minister of Home Affairs to take all such steps and issue all such orders as may be necessary for preserving peace and maintaining order. In other words, he could do anything at all in the name of law and order, be it banning political parties and newspapers, prescribing processions and demonstrations, destroying property, arresting without warrant, or imprisoning without trial. The reason why we had this repressive legislation, uh, which was seen to be against the minority, and undoubtedly that's where it was directed, was against the minority, was quite simply because of the fact that the minority could not be trusted. This, in the minds of the Unionists, was the basic problem, that uh, the Catholic population were people who gave their allegiance to a foreign parliament, who were a threat to the state of Northern Ireland, and therefore the Unionist politicians and the Unionist Parliament felt that they had to have powers and machinery to destroy any threat to the state. The effect in the minority community was to create uh, a terrible feeling of defeatism, that it was impossible to do anything by political means against the state, that every avenue of change was closed because it could be met, it could be made illegal under the Special Powers Act. And that led in the majority of the population to a heavy feeling of defeatism. In a minority, uh, it turned them towards violence as the only possible road. If all constitutional activity was illegal, well, there was no resort left but violence. Omar, September 1924. In a nationalist area, Protestant Unionists demonstrated their loyalty to the United Kingdom. But their government had already acted against the rebel councils. Some were suspended, proportional representation was abolished, and the electoral arrangements juggled so that where there were Catholic majorities, Protestant councils would be returned. Of the 25 nationalist councils of 1921, only two remained by 1925. The Protestant state was secure. Its loyalty is clear. Lord Craig Avon, Prime Minister of Northern Ireland for 20 years, we are part of Great Britain. I think I am right in saying we are the most loyal part of Great Britain. And all Ulster men rejoice in the close relationship 
between the mother country and ourselves. Throughout the 20s, political life in Ulster was uneventful. Politics were parochial and part-time. As the well-to-do enjoyed themselves on the Antrim coast, it could well have been Eastbourne. But in the slums of Belfast, for both Catholic and Protestant, life grew harder. The world recession of the 30s hit the Belfast working class particularly badly. The conditions were appalling. Women working from 6 o'clock in the morning to 6 o'clock at night, and babies born at 8 o'clock, and they were back in on the job, and between 30 and 40 hours, not able to stand on their feet. I saw children with rickets, deformed children. I subsequently discovered that they were suffering from rickets, malnutrition. And you could, you could hear from many of the little kitchen houses the boast and the raucous cough of the consumptive. You see, there was a glut of workers. It's just like having too many uh, uh, strawberries or too many tomatoes. If you have a glut of those, you get them cheap. And there was a glut of workers, human beings, and we were plentiful and we were cheap. It was a difficult time to live in. Tuberculosis was rife in the linen mills of Belfast. A survey revealed that a third of the working class population had too little to maintain their health and ability to work. In housing, health and sanitation, there had been no progress. Belfast's great industry, shipbuilding, was running down. In 1931, Harland and Wolfe launched its last ship for two years. In 1934, workman clerks closed down permanently. One man in four was out of work. Those who'd been out of work for a long time could not claim unemployment benefits. They were forced back on the Victorian poor law. A family with two children got 16 shillings a week, at today's price is about 14 pounds. Four percent of the working population were dependent on the poor law. So this produced a, a, a real indignant atmosphere among the workers. And we had these uh, meetings and um, eventually uh, hunger marches, we had them coming from Derry, and I saw one of these hunger marches arriving in North Street one night, and they were looked like scarecrows, you know, it was really a terrible situation. Some of them were on their bare feet, some of them just had a piece of cloth rolled around their feet, and blisters, poverty. I'm sure the good Lord had a sore heart when he looked down so how we were being treated. But it was a step in the right direction. The Falls and the Schenkel united. We had the drafting into the city of all of the police in Northern Ireland. And we had the armoured cars on the streets. And we had... Uh, it, it was just like an armed camp. You know, the whole of the city. And then martial law was declared. Uh, where three people were gathered together, they could be arrested. And on October 11th, the people decided to defy this, and uh, rioting broke out. The riots of 1932, directed against the poor law guardians, brought movie-tone cameras from England. Anticipating that there might be an attempt to defy the proclamation, reinforcements of police were drafted in from outlying districts to prevent any large assembly of demonstrators approaching the city buildings where the guardians were in session. Despite the emergency measures, however, several processions formed and the police found themselves forced to use first their batons 
and finally their firearms to repel the rioters who were using any missile which came to hand. We reached uh, really the heart of the shankle at Agnes Street uh, when a, an old lady in a shawl, they all wore shawls in those days, came running up and she was in a uh, whale village and she shouted, they're kicking the shite out of the peelers up the falls, are you going to let them down? And of course the, that really set the whole thing alight. They uh, got together, both sections of the community, both Protestants and Catholics, and they went on the round page. They wrecked, they upset Baker's carts and took the stuff for them and gave them to the people. Windows were bashed in and it was absolute chaos. Fire engines, places set on fire, and then the police arrived with rifles in an armored car. And uh, I saw them pursuing these rioters along Agnes Street and I was amazed when I saw some of these men turning and stopping in the doorways and producing revolvers and firing at the police. The riots had taken the classical Belfast pattern. Shops were looted and barricades set up. Cobbles were prized from the streets and thrown at the police. But the poor law rates were doubled. As the police patrolled the now quiet streets, the Catholic Church attacked the riots as communist inspired. The unionist government put it down to republican agitation. And what happened was that the, the unionist politicians very quickly moved into the Protestant ghetto areas and manipulated the situation again into a constitutional uh, problem, uh, whereby they were saying to the ordinary Protestant working class people, look, you can't unite with these Catholics because uh, what they're doing is only a front, that the real reasons behind the, the, the civil un or the labor unrest was quite simply that they wanted to destroy the state of Northern Ireland and take us into United Ireland. And unfortunately, uh, through fear, the Protestant working class believed the stories they were told and very quickly the, the whole movement was divided again. And I think that the, the Catholic Church itself uh, must bear some of the brunt of it because they labeled it as a communist front. And so again you had the, the two extremes manipulating the two working classes uh, into their way of thinking. The Orange Marches of that summer were particularly fervent. A new Republican government in the South was taking a hostile stance towards the North. Unionist politicians responded with speeches appealing to sectarian prejudice. The Prime Minister, Craig Avon, said, It is our duty and privilege to see that we have servants of the most unimpeachable loyalty to King and Constitution in carrying on a Protestant government for a Protestant people. Sir Basil Brooke, later to be Prime Minister, having said he personally did not employ Catholics, went on, Catholics are out to destroy Ulster with all their might and power. They want to nullify the Protestant vote and take all they can out of Ulster and then see it go to hell. And Senator Sir Joseph Davison, Orange Grand Master of Belfast, said, It is our duty to pass the word along from this great demonstration. And I suggest the slogan should be, Protestants employ Protestants. <laughs> In working class Belfast, seen here in a rare home movie in the summer of 1935, there was now little accord between the two sections of the community. After the summer marches of the Orange Order, rioting broke out. I remember that Sunday as well. They came down in droves and droves and droves. And fortunately for us, those streets were dug up. The cobbles were dug up. They were about the concrete. And uh, there was plenty of ammunition, and then the war started. There were stones to it. The first thing I seen the mob at the bottom of the street, and then a few people stopped me and said, your house was trying to get burned to the ground, but the, the poison at this stick saved it the best it could. There were people burned out in uh, Jenny Mount Street and Mailwater Street and all down the Dockland area. And his house was burned. Um, bombs thrown and people killed and funerals. It went on endlessly. And um, it, it reached such a serious stage that the, the, the government uh, called in the British Army. The British Army uh, came in and took over. And along York Street, but in these uh, mixed districts, there was barricades erected. It was almost like a shape of things to come nowadays. Belfast was like a city under martial law, following the worst riots for many years, which left their mark like a scar across the map of Ulster. 
The trouble arose as a party of orange men were returning from Battle of the Boyne celebration. Eleven people had been killed. Catholics were expelled from their jobs, and 500 homes, mostly Catholic, were abandoned. The 1935 rioting had a shattering effect on the Catholic community, I think. They directly blamed the sectarian speeches of, of the government ministers and the prime minister himself in the preceding years for uh, this pogrom against them. And it confirmed for them that they were uh, outsiders in their own country, aliens in their own country. So they felt isolated, vulnerable, and thoroughly demoralized. These streets had witnessed riots in 1886, the early 20s, and would again in the 1970s. Then, as now, British troops would be needed to assist the police. Gradually, the province returned to normal, but the state was still divided, the minority still vulnerable, the majority still besieged. Nineteen fifty-three, a Viking of the Queen's flight, a loyal Ulster welcome for Elizabeth II on her first visit to Northern Ireland as monarch. Dublin had withdrawn the South from the British Commonwealth and declared a republic. But an anxious North had been reassured. Britain, in gratitude for Ulster loyalty in war, had passed the Ireland Act of 1949, guaranteeing that in no event will Northern Ireland, or any part thereof, cease to be part of His Majesty's dominions and of the United Kingdom without the consent of the Parliament of Northern Ireland. This cemented the bond with Britain as powerfully as any Unionist could have wanted. But the country remained deeply divided. Social functions were nearly always segregated and held in halls with religious and political connections. Each community read its own newspapers, kept to its own pubs, doctors, chemists and shops. Catholics played hurling and Gaelic football, Protestants rugby and cricket. The two communities kept to themselves. When they did meet for business, at cattle markets for example, there would be no talk of political or religious matters nor, significantly, of subjects that might lead up to them. But generally, uh, church activities, social activities, uh, each uh, section of the public confine their activities to them. And it's very, very seldom that you'll find, uh, and again I use these words, a Protestant uh, uh, socializing with, an, uh, say, a Roman Catholic community or a Roman Catholic socializing in a Protestant community. I had quite a number of Protestant friends, which isn't usual, particularly in the cities, uh, for Catholics growing up. But there were the occasions, like the month of July. I mean, the first of July, the Union Jacks would go up on the Protestant neighbors' houses, and life changed for that month. The Protestant kids were actively discouraged from playing with us, and their mothers did not, as they did for the rest of the year, congregate in my mother's house for morning tea and chat and gossip. And then once July would be over and the flags would come down, they'd all come sneaking back again. And nobody really passed any remarks. That was uh, the way things were. Tension always mounted in the month of July, when the Orange Order held its traditional marches. They celebrated the victories which had established the Protestant ascendancy in the 17th century. As they passed by or through Catholic districts, they were seen by Catholics as being unnecessarily provocative assertions of superiority. The Orange Order transcended class. Labourer marched with mill owner in defence of their religion and privilege. The Order was committed to instilling the virtues of Protestantism into the minds of its children. Here it had a strange ally the Roman Catholic Church. Although common schooling perhaps offered the best opportunity for healing the wounds of the past and creating an accommodation between the two communities, it had proved impossible to obtain. The Roman Catholic Church insisted on controlling the education of its own people 
despite the loss of state subsidies this entails. Catholics believe that education is the business of the church, but in Northern Ireland, the Catholic laity had other anxieties. The Catholic lay population opposed integrated education because they feared that state control would lead to the teaching of history, for instance, in state schools being a form of political indoctrination. And they also feared that uh, state-controlled schools uh, would discourage uh, the teaching of Irish, the fostering of Irish uh, cultural interests like Irish music and Irish dancing and so on, uh, and Gaelic games, which were the, the, the culture uh, of their community. Uh, both the Protestant Church and the Roman Catholic Church saw integration as a threat to their particular brand of religion. And uh, as long as they were in control of the education, uh, then, particularly at primary school level, then they felt that that uh, was safeguarding their position. On the Protestant side, the Orange Order and the Protestant churches were almost as intransigent as the Catholic hierarchy. They insisted on Bible instruction and syllabuses that were, as the Prime Minister, Lord Craig Avon, had put it, safe for Protestant children. The children of Northern Ireland inhabited two different cultural worlds, and attitudes taught at school would be reflected in the ballot box. Unlike Britain, politics in Northern Ireland were not contested between conservative right and Labour left. Here, the division was religious. Protestant Unionist, Catholic Nationalist. With two-thirds of the population Protestant, a Unionist majority was assured. Catholic politicians in perpetual opposition were largely impotent. In the mid-50s, some Catholics began to vote for the militant Republican Sinn Féin, the political wing of the IRA. It culminated in the election of two Sinn Féin MPs who were, who, who were serving sentences for an arms raid. They were IRA men serving sentences for an arms raid. The election of two of them in 1955 to the Westminster Parliament as a gesture of frustration by the nationalist population. At the same time, the IRA had once again been uh, reviving. Uh, the whole pattern of events has beca had become very cyclical in Northern Ireland. You had a period of constitutional political activity which met with frustration, uh, leading to abstentionism from the parliament, and then a resurgence in support for physical force. The military campaign of the IRA was launched in 1956. Electricity lines were blown up, as this news film of the time shows, while police barracks were attacked and property destroyed. Over four years, there were some 400 incidents. The campaign was largely confined to the countryside, although in Londonderry, a hijacked train was sent careering into the railway station. In the whole campaign, 19 people were killed. With little support amongst the Catholic community, it was easily suppressed by strong security measures. Its main achievement was to remind Protestants that they must remain vigilant. Well, regarding the upsurge of IRA activities in the 50s, the Protestant population weren't too concerned about it because we had faced this problem over the years. And every five, ten years, we had a recurrence of IRA activity. Uh, the Protestant population saw it just as a group of anarchists who were out to destroy the state of Northern Ireland, who didn't get much support from the Catholic population. And we were able to sleep quite calmly in our beds at night because we had the B-Specials and the RUC to defend us. In Northern Ireland, only one policeman in nine was Catholic. Unlike the police in the rest of the United Kingdom, the Royal Ulster Constabulary, the RUC, was armed. But if the Minister of Home Affairs thought that the situation demanded it, the police could be augmented by a voluntary part-time force, entirely Protestant, the B Specials. Arms were not issued as the occasion warranted, but once handed out, were kept at home. The Specials were regularly used, one of the key weapons in the armory of the Northern Ireland state. I decided to join the B-Specials in, that was the 56 campaign, the trouble that we had that time. And that trouble mainly 
came, the, the, the bombers and gunmen in those days came mainly from across the border. And uh, I was an ex-service man who had given quite a few years of service to the British Army. And I thought I could help out in those days because uh, there were some very ruthless attacks being made on people around our area. And I thought it was the right and proper thing to do. The beast specials did keep things quiet because the other side of the house, their own Catholics, were frightened of us. In their own way, they were frightened. We had guns. They had nothing. I felt that this was a strong political weapon. Uh, they were a local force. They knew the local people. They knew local conditions. And because of their local knowledge, they were a great asset to the defense of the country. And of course, this did not please some people. Without question, the B-Specials were a partisan force. They were resented and feared by the Catholic population, who were convinced that in the 20s and 30s riots, the Special Constabulary had supported loyalist attacks and had even been guilty of sectarian murder. Oh, God, hatred. Hatred. Hatred in our hearts. I know I have that hatred in my heart for them. And for the RUC. Could never, never forget what they did, do you know? They were a gang of thugs. They weren't uh, a police force at all, you know, kind of ways. It was one way of getting them into, uh, getting them guns and letting them on the loose. Oh, I, there's no doubt about that. The beast spices, they were confined practically to the one religion because they were ignored by the, by the Roman Catholic population. And they became a sectarian force, which was not for the good of any country, you know. A new parliament building had been opened at Stormont in 1932. The Unionist Party had, by the 60s, held power for 40 years. No Catholic had held ministerial office. The civil service, which served these politicians, was almost entirely Protestant, too. Of 500 important civil servants, only 36 were Catholic. The only successful piece of legislation to originate from the Catholic Nationalist Party was the Wild Birds Act of 1931. And discrimination went beyond government. As the Cameron Report was to show, discrimination against Catholics was widespread throughout Northern Ireland society. Catholics did contribute to the situation they found themselves in, uh, quite simply because of the fact they refused to recognize the state, participate in the state and therefore refused to take jobs in the civil service. That was one area. And then we had their attitude uh, towards education, in which the educational system that appertained within the Catholic community was orientated more towards the arts and languages, whereas in the Protestant state schools, it was orientated towards engineering and banking and commerce. Therefore, the Protestant children were more able to compete for the jobs that were coming on the market. Discrimination had become a way of life by the 1960s. Forty years of the northern state had entrenched it so that in certain areas like uh, local government, uh, under some of the councils, virtually no Catholics were employed or there were grades of posts for which no Catholics need apply. Uh, this had ludicrous examples, like in County Fermanagh, where a majority of the population was Catholic. For the job of school bus driver, which required no great skill, there were something like 75 school bus drivers, of whom only seven were Catholics. This film looked at housing in Fintana, County Tyrone, in 1953. Of the town's 314 houses, about a quarter were like these, old, without basic amenities, and mostly inhabited by Catholics. Most of these little houses hold big families. Here are Mrs. Quinn and three of her children outside their cottage in Back Lane. There are six in the family all living here. Mr. Campbell of Mill Street and some of his children. Eight people live here. There's a family of eight here too. This is Mrs. McGuigan, Castle Street, with five of her children. Mrs. Pearson, Water Lane, with five of her children. Again, a family of eight. Mrs. Mullen of Mill Street has eight children all living here. Big families and little houses are normal in these back streets of Fintana. Forty-eight council houses have been built recently in Fintana, some at Craigavon Park. But only a quarter had gone to Catholics who made up two-thirds of the population. 
It was common for small Protestant families from sound homes to get council houses. For example, number five, Craigavon Park, is occupied only by Mr. Gillespie and his wife. Number 12, only by Mrs. Weir and her daughter. Mrs. Adams lives alone in number nine, and Mrs. Jones alone in number ten. Miss Mills lives alone in number seven. Mr. Gibson and his wife live alone at 24, Mitchellburn Terrace. Mr. Coulter and his wife at number seven. Mr. Holdsworth and his sister at number one. Most of these people already had quite comfortable homes when the council houses were allotted to them. Mr. Holdsworth, for instance, sold this farm at Kilgort, near Fintona, before moving to his new house. This bungalow at Coney Warren, ten miles from Fintona, is also a council house controlled by the Oma Rural District Council. Mrs. Jones left it for 10 Craigavon Park, where she lives alone. Such injustices could not have happened in the rest of the United Kingdom. Local authorities there allocated houses on a point system. People were placed on the waiting list according to the size of their family and the condition of their house. In Northern Ireland, it was at the discretion of local councillors. I would be very foolish to deny that certainly discrimination did take place. But I think it must be pointed out that discrimination went on in both camps. Protestants against Catholics and Catholics against Protestants. And I think it must be accepted that politicians, to exist and continue in power, will always uh, discriminate against the other side uh, to keep their own side happy, uh, to get the votes, to keep them in the position that they're in. Local councillors were not elected on the same basis as their counterparts in Britain. Over a quarter of the population had no vote in local elections, and most people who owned factories, offices and shops had more than one vote. But this was not the only eccentricity in Northern Ireland local government. Many local authorities like Derry, with Catholic majorities, had unionist councils. The device that ensured control by the minority was known as gerrymandering and involved drawing up the electoral boundaries in such a way as to favour one side. The Waterside Ward had 3,500 Protestant voters and 1,800 Catholic. It elected four Unionist councillors. In the North Ward, 4,000 Protestant votes defeated 2,500 Catholic votes to return eight Unionists. In the South Ward, 10,000 Catholic votes, as against 1,100 Protestant votes, returned eight Catholic Nationalist councillors. So in all, 12 Unionist and 8 Nationalist councillors were returned to sit in Derry's Guild Hall. The Unionists controlled the council. 8,800 Protestant votes returned 12 councillors. 14,500 Catholic votes returned 8 councillors. Derry was not unique. Around the old walled city of Derry, a Catholic vote was, in effect, worth less than half a Protestant vote. London Derry was a symbol of Protestant fortitude. Behind these walls, the Protestants in 1689 had heroically resisted the siege of the Catholic King James II. But for Catholics, Derry was a symbol of all that was unjust in the Northern Ireland state. The very stones in Derry oozed discrimination. The city's geographical location symbolized discrimination because Derry was a plantation city. The old walls of the plantation town were still intact. They were still on top of a hill. They looked down upon the vast, sprawling ghetto of the Bogside. And so to the Catholic population of Derry, living in places like the Bogside, they looked up and saw the Protestant city on a hill dominating them dominating them in the 1960s, as it had done in the 1690s. If the Unionists were to retain control of the city, it was impossible to rehouse Catholics in the bog side outside the Catholic ward, since it would upset the delicate electoral balance. The Cameron report said, Council housing policy has been distorted for political ends in Unionist-controlled areas. The people from these slums in the bog side had to be rehoused in the Cregan council estate within the ward. But that only consolidated the Catholic ghetto. Derry was the most depressed city in the United Kingdom. Here, in the 60s, 
unemployment among men was as high as one in five. There was also discrimination of work. An analysis based on the 1961 and 71 censuses found the average Protestant to be a skilled manual worker, the average Catholic an unskilled manual worker. In shipbuilding, 90% of the workforce was Protestant. In engineering, 85%. And the Cameron report found clear evidence of discrimination by local authorities. And those not drawing a wage, the unemployed, were twice as likely to be Catholic. In a whole lot of areas of private employment, particularly in the shipyards and the skilled engineering industry and so on, hardly any Catholics were employed. With the result, with, with, with important effects on the structure of the Catholic population, so that by the beginning of the 1970s, surveys have discovered that the Catholic community had become one with a very small professional middle class, uh, a very, very small skilled sector and a very large sector of unskilled, semi-skilled, unskilled, and also unemployed. This growing unskilled Catholic working class was excluded from political life and the social satisfaction of work. From this strata of society would come those who would first throw the stone, then the petrol bomb, and finally take up the gun. But in the 1960s, these injustices, the siege mentality that sustained them, and the sense of grievance they were nurturing, were acknowledged by few in Northern Ireland, and even fewer in Britain. For the moment, the back streets of Belfast were only filmed by amateur photographers. <laughs>